Hello, my name is John Gabriel. I'm an, inter I'm an interviewer for the Public Library of Hamilton County, Cincinnati and Hamilton County. I'm interviewing Bill Cook today on July 1 of 2008 at the main library. Our camera operator today, today is Dennis Daly. Good afternoon, Mr. Cook. Good afternoon, John. We're going to talk about your experiences leading up to and during the Korean War. Um, I appreciate you coming down today spending well, your time this way. I think it's great that you're doing this. Thank more you. More Thank you. It's my pleasure. Let's start off with a little bit about where, where you grew up, what you did, all like that before the war. Well, grew up in downtown Covington, a uh, little street called 80th Avenue. It was about uh, less, than, less than a block and a half from Mother of God Church and school. That's where I went to school. And, uh, you know, normal. It was, it was rough times because it was in the 30s, mm -hmm. and you know it was the depression was just about to end. But uh, we had nothing, but neither did any of our neighbors, so we didn't we didn't know how poor we were. <laughs> but uh, I went to Coming Catholic High School, and the building is no longer there, right across the street from the church, and uh, graduated from Coming Catholic High, and uh, went to work. Where was that? at a wholesale jewelry company in, down in uh, downtown on uh, 6th Street. Mm -hmm. It's no longer in business called Swigert, E&J Swigert. And uh, from there I was uh, drafted. It was kind of a, <laughs> a funny story because uh, myself and three of my high school buddies went to join the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And it was in uh, early December. And uh, I asked the recruiter, I said, uh, you know, I don't know how many Christmases I'll miss. I said, can I stay Christmas this year at home and go in, you know, right after Christmas? He says, no, can't do that. Hmm. So I said, well, I'm going to take my chances. So I got home and about three days later, I got my draft notice. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my other two, my two buddies, they went on into... Uh, the Air Force. Did they end up in Korea? Uh, no, I think I think one of them may have went to Japan, but uh, no, they. Uh, so when did you ship out? Well, first of all, I uh, went to Fort Knox, which was fortunate because I could come home a lot. Yeah. And uh, took uh, naturally eight weeks of basic infantry training, and then uh, they selected me for leadership school which was more advanced infantry training. Um, Where was that conducted? That was also at Knox, okay. Fort Knox. And uh, so uh, when I graduated from that, um, I, my company that I graduated with was, they were getting ready to ship out, but uh, my mother had a very serious illness and I have a, received a 10 day emergency furlough. Hmm. When I got back, my unit was gone, and I was kind of just drifting around, <laughs> you know, <with, laughs> I didn't belong to anywhere at that point. So um, about two weeks of that, and uh, I got called to the captain's office, and uh, his name was Captain Martin, great guy. He says, Cook, what do you know about tanks? I said, sir, the only thing I know about tanks is that they kick up a lot of dust when we're out there marching. <laughs> he says, well, you're going to be a tank instructor. And I said, the heck I am. He said, yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this, is, this is typical Army, I guess. He sent a sergeant with me. We took a tank out on the driving range. And I am not kidding you, 45 minutes. And he said, well, I've got to I'm, I'm going to Louisville, I got a pass. He says, let's go back to the motor pool and sign you out with this tank. He gave it to you after 45 minutes? 45 minutes, I was a tank instructor. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Typical army back then. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, I, um, I learned fast and uh, I trained, I guess, probably between two and 300 young guys to drive a tank. Oh, as a driver? That's, that, that was the training. Course. Driving and maintenance, right. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Right. What was your rank at this time? PFC. And I got that from leadership school, and rank was frozen. Mm -hmm. So I, 
uh, the, uh, I was considered tank commander, I think it's 3795 MOS, and uh, that calls for a sergeant first class rating. But rank was frozen, and uh, so I, I didn't get any promotion. Uh, is a tank, would you, would you say a tank is difficult to drive? Was it what? Difficult to drive? No, no, it was, no, it wasn't difficult to drive. It, it, you had, the older, the M4 Sherman tank is what, one they used in the Second World War. And uh, it had sticks, you know, turn right, turn left, brake, mm -hmm. and a gas pedal. It was pretty simple. Okay, and that's what you were instructing the other mm -hmm. guys how to drive? Mm -hmm. is, that what you, is that what you eventually found yourself driving? You no, unfortunately, uh, when we got to uh, Korea, it was kind of a little aside there, it was, they had M46s, those are, sure, those are uh, patent tanks, M46. Much bigger and much, uh, we had a 76 millimeter cannon on the little tanks and, the, uh, and this one had a 90 millimeter. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, it was kind of funny because when we were trying to get up this mountain, we, well, we, first of all, our journey from, from uh, the little, little town, we, we, we came over on and we landed at Incheon and we went to um, Chuncheon, which is about 30 miles from uh, Incheon by truck. And, uh, we had to wait there for our tanks and be indoctrinated on the tanks. So it was about three or four days there and uh, here comes these tanks. I said, what is this? <laughs> and I didn't know anything about them. So they made me a bow gunner, uh -huh. which uh, sits next to the driver and you have a 30 caliber machine gun. But basically uh, the, the position that we were in at that time, we we brought the tank all the way up to the top of this uh, hill 1242 that they, they go by meters. So 12, 1242 is what, probably 3,500 feet elevation roughly. And uh, we uh, pulled the tank all the way up to, uh, they, they had a, a, what, an escarpment, I guess you'd call it, and with a, enough room to get our, our gun out, aim the gun out, you know to the enemy positions. And they told us, when they said, when you get there, you're there to stay because once it snows, you can't get back down. Hmm. Uh, and that's an interesting thing. Um, our trip from um, Chun Chun, uh, I mean, up when we went, through, we went through Seoul and it was nothing but rubble. Uh, I, I'd love to go back there and see the city now, but it was just nothing but rubble. And it really was, this was on a train, by the way. Was this a, somewhere around January, February of 1952? Um, no, this was probably late September. Yeah. It was, just, it, was October, it was getting into October. It was pretty, getting pretty chilly. And uh, on the train, um, there was no windows or anything, you know, and the soot comes in. And, but these little kids, that's what got to me. These little kids running around with bare feet mm. and most of their fathers were dead. Their mothers were conscripted to uh, work for the government. And uh, these little kids running along, alongside the train, GI, GI. We had whatever we had, candy, whatever, we threw it out to them, you know. And uh, you know, I, I have nine children now and wow. uh, it, uh, I think now back at that and I wonder you know my god how those kids make it mm. but uh, anyway uh, in our secret move we had a secret move um, let me preface that our tanks there was an island called Kojido and the communist forces, when, we, when they took prisoners, they transferred them to Kojido in a prison camp over there. Well, they rioted, they made some homemade weapons and they killed a couple of GIs. And so they called in the tanks. So our, our tanks, before I got to there, our tanks went in there and caused some, wreaked some havoc and there was a couple of the prisoners got killed. So anyway, 
we had the secret move from, excuse me, where we picked up the tanks up to our positions. And we went through four or five villages and uh, using blackout lights. Hmm. When we got to our position, we were hardly even there. And a mortar round came in and it hit about from far from me to that window. And uh, you learn real quick how quick you can get on the ground. <laughs> anyway, it popped and leaflets came up. And they were printed in English on one side and Korean on the other side. And it says, welcome to the 40th division. We'll be up to get you. No kidding. They, so this secret, there were a lot, of, a lot of sympathizers in those villages that probably called ahead, you know, on a two-way radio or whatever. Where, and, where uh, is this on the Korean Peninsula? Um, well, if you know where the 38th parallel runs, kind of right, right across the center of the, uh, the little city of Chuncheon is about 30 miles north of, of um, the, the capital, Seoul. Seoul. Yeah, okay. it's about 30 miles north of the capital. And then uh, where we were is probably another 30 miles northeast of Seoul. I mean, of Chuncheon. Okay. So uh, we were in uh, above the, the 30th parallel kind of, kind of made a, a jog like this. And we were about probably 15 miles into North Korea the whole time we were there. Oh, good Yeah. When you found yourself uh, facing the, uh, the enemy, was it North Koreans or were they Chinese? Both. Both. Mm -hmm. And on your side, were you just Americans or did you have other U.S. We, we had some, uh, <coughs> some uh, rock soldiers, uh, not in our outfit, but there was a, uh, on one of our flanks, there was a rock uh, regiment and uh, they were they wound up being good soldiers at first they uh, they would they would just cut and run hmm. but they wound up being good soldiers and they you know um, our outfit lost we lost 99 wow 99 men what, what what outfit were you with um the 224th infantry regiment and uh, was 40th infantry division 224th regiment tank company and, and then the tank company had 1st and 2nd platoon. I was in the 2nd platoon. So, but, skipping back to where you were a little while ago, they told you once you get your, your gun set, you're not going to move once mm -hmm, the snow comes. Right, right. Is that where you sat? Mm -hmm. How long did you stay? All through the, through the winter. Um, the, uh, they, after about, about three days after we got these leaflet rounds, um, we uh, we had uh, they they tried to they tried to overrun us. Was it the Chinese and, uh, at this point? Um, I think it was a combination. Tell me how that started. Probably probably more North Koreans than there were Chinese, but uh, but the North Koreans, like they they told us, they said you're you're in their they're you're in their country now. You're in North Korea, and they're going to be fierce, and they were. Hmm. And uh, they uh, they launched an attack against us, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm rambling. If it, I want know. you to go, I think this is going to be interesting. I think um, you're doing a good job. They launched an attack, and um, if you know anything about machine gun rounds and stuff, only every fifth bullet is a tracer. And the uh, platoon sergeant came into our bunker and he said, carry all the ammunition you can possibly carry. Take every weapon that you got. And he said, uh, burn everything that will link you to the 40th Division, especially the 224th Regiment in particular, hmm. and tank company in more, even more particular. So Why he said- Why did he want you to burn all that? Because he said, if you get captured, he said, if we get overrun, he said, if you get captured, it would be really rough on you, knowing that you're from that outfit. Okay. And uh, so uh, we left the bunker, and 
the tracer bullets, it was looked like the 4th of July. And, uh, and when you know that only one out of five is a tracer. <laughs> so we crawled, you know, we, we crawled to the tank. And uh, this is where my friend Charlie, that you saw his picture there, he did a he did something that I I, I just never forget. He uh, they had already run the turret around. We're starting to get ready to fire the 90 millimeter, and my position in the tank is on the right side, and you can't get in if the, if the gun is facing forward. They have to swing the gun around so I could get. And uh, I couldn't get in the hatch. So anyway, they swung the. He swung the turret around, and I got in, and I couldn't close the hatch because the machine gun, the 50 caliber up on top of the tank had been firing nonstop, and the, the bullets are connected with little round rings, ammo rings, and all those rings had filled in the groove in that turret. Oh, wow. And I couldn't get the thing closed. Well, we were afraid if we got run over, the first thing I would do would be drop a hand grenade in that turret, and that'd be goodbye everybody. So um, Charlie got out of the main turret where he was he was helping with fire the gun. He got out of the main turret and reached over and with his hand scraped all of those. metal rings out of there. And he pushed my head down, slammed the hatch, and wow. I locked it down. Oh, boy. And uh, I mean, you know, how the man did not get a bullet, I don't know. Were you standing outside the tank while all this I was, firing was going on, I, trying to get in? I was laying on the ground. Oh, my gosh. And, and the bullets are whizzing by. Mm -hmm. Where are they, are they? Are they coming up the hill at you? Or, or are you facing down the hill? Well, they were firing, they were firing mortar rounds, machine guns, and, you know, whatever they could get their hands on. We didn't have any heavy artillery, thank God, uh, coming in on us, but we did have a lot of mortar rounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was funny because I, I felt something wet on my leg, and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm hit. And I reached down, and it was cold, so I knew it wasn't blood. It was my canteen. <laughs> and uh, whether it got a, a shrapnel in it or, or just, I don't know, but, but I took it off and just Without thinking I would need it later, I flung it down the mountainside. <laughs> I was so glad that it wasn't me. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that uh, we re re repulsed the attack. Were, and, they, uh, were the enemy troops eventually charging up the hill at you? Uh, well, they had they had a uh, a forward uh, group that that got. But fortunately, see, we had an infantry regiment. Uh, excuse me, an infantry company, Company E below us, down further down the hill. And uh, they, they had machine guns, hand grenades, everything. They, so they basically, between them and my tank, we repulsed the attack. Wow. And uh, so. Um, Did the enemy have any kind of anti-tank weapons? Not there, they didn't. Not there. They uh, they did, but uh, but but uh, this was in uh, '52. So by that time, they you know they it was pretty much a a stalemate type of. In fact, of the matter, it was. Um, we could tell by how much incoming fire we got what was going on in Pam and John. No kidding. Pam and John, they they had a big discussion whether they should use a round table or a square table. I think they went to the round table so that there would be no, nobody sitting in a higher position. The Orientals are funny that way. <laughs> anyway, so uh, they finally got up and walked out. The Chinese got up and walked out and then we caught hell some more. <laughs> I mean, then they started incoming, a lot of incoming fire and rounds and stuff. And, uh, um, Were you in that location th during your entire time in Korea? Yes. Yeah. How, how, we how we did. did we had. Um, I think I went. We got one one time that we, uh, when the weather cleared up, that we got to go in and take a shower, and got a, a, a meal because we just ate nothing but sea rations. Oh. And. Uh, 
How many months uh, were Now, I, I can tell you a story about the sea rations. <laughs> I'd love to hear that. They have what we call chogies. They were Korean civilians that carried mermite cans on their back, and they were real strong guys with their legs, and they, would, they came up the, this was Thanksgiving, and they came up the hill, uh, a path that winds around up to the top of the hill, carrying uh, turkey dressing and mashed potatoes and the whole nine yards. So there was a little, what they call a child bunker, it's just a lean-to, a little lean-to shelter. And they told us, bring your mess kit, single, one at a time, because there were, in another area there were seven guys waiting for a child line and got killed by an by a, a, a incoming um, artillery shell. Hmm. So the guys graduated and went, gradually went over one at a time. I was about probably maybe fifth or sixth in line. And uh, I well, it was my turn to go. I went over and I got, boy, it was great. I had to, it's all smeared together, but it, it was, look, it was, it was wonderful. Hot coffee and, and uh, I was on my way back to the bunker. It was maybe, I don't know, maybe 50 yards from the bunker to the chow bunker. I was on my way back to the bunker and here comes the mortar rounds. Oh, so I hit the dirt. Now, my Thanksgiving dinner went down the mountain. Oh, no. I crawled back to the bunker and ate some sea rations. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> was glad to be alive to get them, too. So you were, you were in this position, just holding steadily while the peace talks were going on in Pam and John, mm -hmm. not taking any, but not giving any more space away. Were you conducting patrols? Uh, the infantry, yes. They, 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 uh, that, that's another... Uh, Another difficult story for me to talk about, but um, the uh, infantry sent out a, a, a patrol. This was on December the 22nd, and um, they went into uh, enemy territory. It was a uh, not a search and destroy, but it was a uh, they were trying to take a prisoner, try to capture a prisoner, and. Uh, I was on, on the tank, and uh, it was so cold, it was just bitter, it, that was, it got down to 30 below zero. Oh. Uh, I'm glad they didn't have wind chills back then, but at 30 below zero, uh, this particular night, I guess it was probably, it was three nights before Christmas, and I think it was probably maybe 10, 15 below zero, and this patrol was out. And uh, I'm sitting there with all this firepower, standing in the turret with a 50 caliber machine gun. And all of a sudden I heard some, some yelling. I couldn't see anybody because they're down in the valley. I heard some yelling and I heard a Chinese burp gun, which it, it's a strange sound. I mean, it's, it's a very distinctive sound. It just sounds like it fired so fast, and I heard this burp gun, two or three bursts from a burp gun. Never heard one of our M1 rifles or anything. And um, it was five-man patrol, and uh, they were all killed. And I'm sitting there and couldn't do a thing for them. I heard them screaming. I heard them dying, oh. and I could not do anything for them. Did, did did uh, you see any of the Chinese prisoners eventually that were taken? No, I didn't see any because any prisoners that were taken would have been taken by the, the infantry and taken to a, a higher headquarters. I see. But um, the next day they went out and, uh, and brought those guys back. They were, of course, they were frozen and their uniforms were gone, their weapons were gone. So that was, uh, and I never knew who they were. Huh until a few years ago, one of our, we have a paper, that, that, a regimental paper that they send out every, about every three months, four months. And about three, four years ago, I got a paper and it lists all the KIAs, killed in actions from our, 
from our regiment. And here was December the 22nd, and there was those five names. No kidding. And it gave me a little bit of closure because every Christmas I used to think about those guys and I didn't even know who they were. And, and thinking I could have, if I could have seen where they were, I could have saved their lives, maybe. How far down in the valley were, you, were oh, they from you? Um, I don't know, I would say it's probably several hundred yards anyway, at least. Mm. I had one occasion shortly after that to uh, get down into that valley, no man's land. Um, we had the infantry went out again, and uh, they got ambushed again. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a uh, personnel carrier. There's a picture of it in there. I don't know if you know what it is. It's a, it's a tank without a top. It's just, and uh, so I was the only one Myself and a sergeant by the name of Bob Stockinger were the only two that knew how to drive it because it was like the old tank with the sticks. And we were the only two that knew how to drive it. And uh, he was due to rotate home in less than seven days, five days as a matter of fact. And um, I said, Bob, I said, I'll, I'll take it. Don't. I said, you know, you, you're too close to rotating. And he says, no, I'm going. So he drove and I manned the machine gun and we took uh, some medics with us and uh, we went down into no man's land there and, and uh, they loaded up the wounded on stretchers and put them across the uh, personnel carrier. Well, Sorry, wait a minute. You want to pause the tape? <clears throat> One of the guys who was seriously wounded, um, when we were getting ready to go, we were driving without lights, obviously, because we didn't know whether the we didn't know whether the enemy had regrouped and would attack again, or whether they had dispersed, or just what what they were going to do. So. Um, this man was seriously wounded, and he uh, he said, uh, "Hey, tanker," he says, "Would you give me a would you give me a cigarette?" He said, and I said, uh, "Buddy, I said I can't I can't light a cigarette lighter here." I said, "We don't know, you know, till wait till we get to our back to our own lines." And I said, "I'll I'll light you a cigarette." He didn't make it. <laughs> Last request was a cigarette. <clears throat> Was it, had he been injured, uh, he had been shot, is that, is that what happened? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Did you ever come across any enemy armor? Armor? Yeah. No, uh, no, they, they didn't have any armor in that mountainous. Mm -hmm. now, now, before I got there, there was, uh, when they were in the, what they called Kumwa Valley, um, they, uh, they had, uh, the enemy had some armor, but not, not in that mountainous area they didn't. I see. Uh, I noticed, uh, I, I did a little research before I came over here, and I, and I was, I was going to ask if you were in any of these areas, and one was the Kumwa Valley, and Chorwa, and the Punch Bowl. Hard Punch Bowl, Bowl, yes. Punch Bowl and uh, Satayri, those are the two uh, battle stores that I have. I see. Satayri Valley and, and the Punch Bowl. What's this? Is is the area you're talking? You've been talking about now. Is that is that the punch bowl? Mostly, mostly Saturday, Saturday. Uh, the, uh, the the one one beautiful thing over there was the punch bowl. Uh, when in the morning, when the fog would lift, the punch bowl is a is an area surrounded by mountains. It's a big valley surrounded by mountains, and, and it has a pass at the end, and from if you can imagine, it looks like a giant punch bowl. And in the, uh, in the morning, the few times that the sun came out, and it would clear the uh, fog, and the fog would roll out of that valley. It just looked like pouring cream out of a pitcher. <laughs> and that was really pretty. It was the only thing pretty I saw huh. the whole time I was there. <laughs> 
about Sandbag Castle? Is that where you go? No, Sandbag Castle was not too far from us. Um, if you, this one picture that I show, show, showed you, uh, Heartbreak Ridge, was uh, to our left and over the, it was pretty far away. I mean, probably, as a crow flies, probably about five, six miles. I see. Uh, uh, those, those are all, including the ones you were involved in, uh, operations that were very uh, highly touted for the, uh, for the 40th, uh, at least by the historians online. Yeah. Well, the, um, uh, the hill that I was on in the course of the three-year war, it, it changed hands probably three or four times. In fact, after I rotated home, uh, it, it was uh, our tanks had to go and, and down the valley and reclaim that hill. I'll be done. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that you'd had a back injury. Was it combat mm -hmm. related? Um, well, you don't you don't get purple hearts for injuries. You only get them for wounds. But uh, um, our tank commander was killed. Yeah. Um, he he was he he had taken uh, what they call TDY uh, temporary duty with the uh, third division, and uh, they needed a uh, needed a tank commander over there. And while he was there, he was killed. Um, Two of our guys were slightly wounded, and uh, mine was just an injury. Of course, it plagued me. It still does. Mm. But um, what happened is that bunker I was telling you that was beat up so bad with mortar rounds, and, yeah. and then, then, uh, then there was a fire inside of it. So they, they uh, were rebuilding a new bunker uh, about, I don't know, 20 or 30, about 30 yards, I guess, from it. And uh, we were occupying it, or, but they were still putting the, uh, the tar paper roof. They, you know, they put tar paper on the, on the roof, and then they cover that with about five, four or five levels of sandbags to absorb the, the uh, shells. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was walking out the door of that bunker, and a couple of the engineers or GIs were putting the tar paper, and they slope it so the snow will run off. Well, it got away from them. A full roll of tar paper got away from them, oh. and it hit me in the back and knocked me down the mountain. Oh, my God. So uh, they put me on what they called light duty for uh, five or ten days. And uh, then I went back to my outfit. So you were in this location. Enemy is across the valley and obviously in no man's land, they're laying mm -hmm. ambushes. Are you under constant sniper and fire, mortar fire? Yeah, there are lots of mortar fire and uh, sniper fire, that's, <laughs> yeah, I almost got, almost could have met my maker that day. Um, a tank down below us, he called up, he said, oh, we were tank 10, he said, hey, tank 10, he said, I'm catching sniper fire. He said, would you watch for the muzzle, the muzzle flash? And so I said, okay, keep your head down, just reach up and fire your weapon, your, your machine gun. So he did, and uh, sure enough, I saw the muzzle flash. So I opened fire on that, where the muzzle flash was. And while I was doing that, he calls me back. He says, get your head down. He says, there's, there's bullets bouncing all over the mountain down below you, right huh. just below you. So it, it, was, it, was, it was, I saw his muzzle flash and another machine gunner over there saw my muzzle flash. And so it was a cat and mouse game. Oh boy, how long did that last? You must have gotten down. Not too long. <laughs> <laughs> I got my head down and just, you know, fired like this, over like that, you know. Did you, did you fire the, uh, the big gun at the, uh, where you saw the muzzle flashes? The, uh, uh, we, uh, not that particular time, but we would, uh, we would uh, call in, uh, we would call in artillery rounds sometimes. And uh, uh, on those cold winter nights, you could hear those things. 
where you could hear them going, going across. But they, they were long distance. They weren't, they weren't shooting at what we were shooting at. They were shooting at the big stuff, hmm. at, you know, further back. They're mechanized in uh, their troop and, and placements and things. So your day-to-day -day life, you're up in the morning, you got to worry about mortar rounds all day long. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. How many weeks did this go on? How many months? Uh, I, was, I was there, I don't know, I was only there like four and a half, four and a half months, something like that, because uh, I, I didn't think I would even go because um, being what they call cadre in, at Fort Knox, um, I thought, you know, I thought I pretty much had it made. <laughs> So one day I saw my name on the list, <laughs> VCOM, Far East Command. So after four and a half months was over, that seems like a, a shorter tour than some of the guys. Did oh, yeah. You, did you rotate home after that? Yeah. Um, went to uh, Sasebo, Japan, and uh, waited for a ship there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I consider myself very fortunate because, um, you know, um, we, uh, you know, we lost we lost a lot of guys, and there was a couple of uh, pretty good skirmishes after I left. When when you guys took the most casualties, was it during that one big operation where they tried to overrun you, or was it day to day, one guy here, one guy there? Um, it was it, it was day to day. It was a total of uh, regiment. It was a total of ninety nine, and there were times when you know there would be no casualties, wound, wounded maybe, but no no ki no killed in actions for. Uh, days at a time and then and then you'd have another time when mortar rounds would come in heavy and, and you'd have maybe four or five casualties in one day you know but uh, mm. must have been some, some real the uh, the, Na the navy uh, the marine air the marine air force came by with the old corsairs remember the old gold wing oh, sure. corsairs and that was a horrible sight they that was the only time we could stand upright on the ML on the MLR, I mean, back down down on the back side of the mountain, we could yes, but but uh, up on the line, you had to you had to crawl, and then you know get in the tank, and uh, usually uh, uh, through the escape hatch underneath. Oh, yeah. so, but uh, the uh, when the weather cleared a little bit, the Navy Corsairs came over and dropped napalm, and that is horrible stuff. No kidding. Oh my God, it's horrible. Were they the uh, only kind of air cover you saw, or did you see some jet fighters no, too? No, no, there were no jets there. They were the jets were up in the uh, uh, valley areas. I see. Up, uh, but uh, those corsairs, they would drop that napalm, and uh, man, it was wicked, wicked stuff. I mean, it burned everything, rocks, everything. No kidding. It's liquid, it's liquefied, it's, it's jelly gasoline is what it is. Oh, brother. And uh, when the, they drop it in 50-gallon drums, and they just tumble, and when they hit, they explode. I'll be done. Did the, uh, did the uh, enemy have air, air cover coming? Uh, give it not not in our area, no. Not area. No, no. Fortunately, we, 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 we didn't have that. One of the things that, that um, I think brought the Korean War to the American living rooms was that show MASH. Mm -hmm. now, I realize that probably wasn't very realistic, but they did, they did feature helicopters bringing wounded in. Did you see that happen? Every day. Every, every day. day helicopters went over with, a, with two stretchers on the, on the pods. Every day. I'll be there. Sometimes four or five times a day. How far away were they taken? Uh, well, there were some of the, you know, some of the units that, that were in areas that were not as mountainous, where there was a little bit more actual combat activity constantly. The 7th, the 7th Infantry Division, they were, I mean, excuse me, the 3rd Infantry Division, they really caught heck over there. Mm. Uh, and uh, they would, they would, the casualties would come over, go into a mass unit every day, several times a day. You hear that old, you hear that old whirly bird coming over and two stretchers. That one uh, instance that I told you about where the, we picked up those wounded guys down in, in the, uh, in the uh, 
no man's land, or they called it. Uh, we took them to a forward aid station. The mass units were a little bit farther behind. Where was the aid station? Um, it was very close to uh, our position uh, in the, uh, more or less in, in, not up on a mountain, but in a, in a valley. Okay. Uh, it was not probably more than maybe five miles from, uh, from where our uh, regimental rear area was. You know, we, we probably got 15 minutes or so left on the tape. Now, I, I'm not saying you have to use it all up, but I do want to ask you something about the day-to-day -day life there. You know, what kind of what kind of conditions you slept in, what you, what you did all day, how you stayed warm, that sort of um, thing. Well, there were 10 men, two tank crews in, in a bunker, a 10 by, roughly 10 by 20 bunker. And um, we, you know, we, we hardly had any water the water was very scarce. We, uh, we would melt snow, and we would take a steel helmet and fill it with snow, and then put it on the potbelly stove in the bunker, and that we'd shave with it and wash with it. Oh. Sometimes we'd have three or four guys shave with the same pot of water. Oh, you know. And uh, uh, still had the typical army go out and pick up stuff, <laughs> you know, somebody, somebody drop a, a can from their, only one time we, we refused to do it, and that was when we were under sniper fire, and uh, this uh, um, infantry lieutenant came up with his blue scarf on and his neat uniform, and, and he told us to go down and pick up all the empty shell casings. And our gunner said, uh, no, sir. He said, I'm giving you a direct order. And he said, sir, we're getting sniper fire. And he said, are you a man or are you a... He said, yes, sir, I'm a man and I, I'm going to stay alive. <laughs> so anyway, he, he went back and told our company commander. And our company commander said, you get the hell, uh, heck out of here and don't bother my guys. Wonderful. So, you know. Were you receiving mail every day? Were you able to get mail and have it? Anything? Yeah, it took a while. Yeah. It took a while, but we got mail. And there was a lot of, a lot of problems with frostbite. Um, the medics would come up um, either in a Jeep or a four, a four, you know, six by something that would come up the hill. And uh, they would, about every uh, week or 10 days, and they would sit there while you changed your socks. And they'd take the old socks with them. They want to make sure you stay healthy. Yeah. yeah. I'll be done. Frostbite became a, a, um, a, an offense that you could get court-martialed by. Court-martial offense if you've got frostbite because of, hmm. you know. I'll be done. But we didn't get our winter, we didn't get our winter boots until, uh, gee. It was the snow on the ground, and it was already well below zero before we got our winter boots. So lucky you had that pot belly stove in the bunker, huh? Uh, it, it, uh, there was no wood. The trees were all gone. There was no, there was no wood to use. So they used uh, uh, kerosene, a cheap grade of gasoline, and uh, you had to be really careful because there, was, there were two, two guys that, that died from uh, the fumes. They had the bunker closed up real tight, oh, and, wow. uh, and uh, two of them had two, two, two casualties from, uh, from the uh, stove. Well, I asked you about the, your day-to-day -day conditions because it sounded to me like you were in a very uncomfortable, stalemated sort of environment. Yeah, it was, time. you know, it was, it was, you know, it was bitter cold. I mean, you had no, you had no food other than, than, than K, uh, sea rations and um, coffee made on a, you know, with snow basically most of the time and uh, uh, problem with rats. I had to go, the, the medics come up once in a while and check you out, see how you're doing, and I had, I had my ear was so stopped up, they had to 
clean my ears out from the uh, on the rats would chew through the sandbags and they would the sand would get near while you're sleeping. Oh my gosh. I remember one occasion I was writing a letter, I told my mother, she was a worry wart. I was writing a letter and I said, Mom, I, I told her, I said, I'm so far from the from the fighting I can't even hear the guns. With that a mortar round hit on our roof and the sandbag came down and covered my note oh my letter my and I said, Oh, I'm being punished. <laughs> Don't lie to mom. <laughs> oh boy. But you know, it is I about some time that long, but you know. There was one other occasion when I, I again that, that personnel carrier, uh, I was assigned to take 90 millimeter ammunition and 100 octane gasoline to another tank off to our, our flank. And I uh, had a couple of infantry guys to help unload it. And uh, we're going blackout, but in, in that cold air, you can hear an engine miles off. Well, we got a mortar round. Here's what they, they fired mortar rounds. One, two, three. So they skipped 20 yards. One, two, three. Another one, two, three. They always fired nine rounds. Huh. So the first three hit. And when the fourth one hit, I said, let's get off this tank. You know, it's a bomb waiting to go off. So we looked for a place to hide. And all there was was a little cut out in the side of a mountain and we got in there and guess what was in there? What? 76 millimeter ammunition. <laughs> so the, the, the seventh round hit and, I, and I, I swear now, I was praying. I was praying. I said, God, is this how I'm going to die in this hole? And it was my, my two cohorts. And uh, the eighth round hit, the ninth round would have hit that it would have obliterated that and probably incinerated all of us. Oh, man. The ninth round never happened. Oh, my gosh. The ninth round never came. They always fired three volleys of three. The ninth round never came. I said, I don't know whether they ran out of ammunition or God <laughs> hurt me, <laughs> but whatever. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, it sounds like from uh, what you showed me before the interview started, that you keep in touch with at least one or two of the guys. Is, is that right? Yeah, uh, those reunions, it's, uh, you, you know, you have a lot of camaraderie at the reunions. Did, did these guys uh, rotate out when you did? The guys um, your no, some of them before me, some of them after me. Okay. Did your whole crew leave at the same time? No. No? Oh, boy. No. So they, get, they, they received a new... Uh, driver or machine gunner when you left? Yeah, yeah, I had a, re I had a replacement. Um, in fact, I, I, I send him a Christmas card every year. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me about when you left. You went to Sasebo, Japan. Sasebo, right. How long were you yeah. there, and then, and then what happened after Oh, uh, well, we were supposed to be in Sasebo just a matter of uh, four or five days, but uh, the ship that was coming over to get us uh, we were going to uh, San Francisco. We, we shipped out from Seattle and we were supposed to uh, re-embark into uh, San Francisco and uh, being a California National Guard, we were looking forward to that because they would have treated us pretty good. But that ship lost a screw, a propeller, three days out from, J from Japan. So they had to send another ship and it happened to be the very same one that we came over on and it was out of Seattle. So we went back through Seattle, Washington. Okay. But uh, did you stay in the uh, army after that? No. Had a uh, they they rented a uh, the army leased a whole uh, fleet of uh, converted C-46s, the old flying, and uh, they flew us, and they weren't they weren't pressurized, so they couldn't go over about. 10,000 feet, and we went over the Rocky Mountains in a, in a severe thunderstorm. Oh it was a sergeant sitting behind me. The plane would go up and down, up and down, you know, like that. And they gave us box lunches, and we're sitting there, and his back lunch hit the ceiling. <laughs> and he said, if I could get off this plane right now, I'd go back to Korea. <laughs> and he was there for a, almost a year. Oh, boy. <laughs> 
And I said, Sergeant, I said, I'm scared too, but I'm not that scared. <laughs> so anyway, we landed at Omaha and refueled and from Omaha to uh, um, Indiana where we, uh, where we were, Fort, Fort Breckenridge at the time. Uh, it was a real smooth flight from, uh, from Omaha down to Indiana. But from Seattle to Omaha, it was rough. So you mustered out uh, right away after that? Yeah, basically uh, about, I think it uh, might have been Camp Breckenridge. It's no longer there. I think I was at Camp Breckenridge maybe two days. Uh, then they, they, you know, you got all this paperwork you got to sign and they give you your, your mustering out pay and a train ticket mm -hmm. to Cincinnati. And uh, when I got off that train in Cincinnati, I felt like I was finally home. Good for you. Yeah, I was finally home. What, what, what was your career like what, after, you, after you got out of the military? Well, I, I had couple of different jobs. I didn't stay at Swigert's too long. I, I went back there. there. It wasn't a good income, but I went back there basically because I knew everybody there and I had some readjusting to do. Uh, I was walking down the main street of Covington one day and, and it was close to 4th of July. It was, it was a couple months after I got out and somebody fired a big firecracker and I, and, and I was on the sidewalk. You know, it was, yeah, sure. it was just, you didn't think about it. You just and, and you know, people were looking at me like, what's the matter with you, you know? But anyhow, um, I wound up in the uh, selling recreational vehicles. Okay. Yeah, I did, this, I did that for about, uh, oh gosh, over 20 years, I guess. Wow, wow. And you got married, and you had nine married, children. Had nine children, and oh, yeah. we couldn't afford to do anything else but camp. <laughs> well, there you go. I'd take a used unit off of the lot, and off we'd go. The kids loved it. Well, we're probably getting close to the uh, to our time here. If there's anything you've left out, well, the only thing that I'm the only thing I'm concerned with is that I talk too much, and and you probably had a lot more questions. No way, man. This is your time. I'm glad you told your story. I appreciate your service and, and the time you spent to come here today. So, if if uh, if you have anything else. If you don't have anything else, I should say. Well, the, the only thing I have is, is I guess, probably a, 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 an observation. I think that this is a really a wonderful thing that you're doing. Um, I mean, the Second World War veterans, Korean veterans now are going pretty fast. And Vietnam's too, not, far, not too far behind us. Yeah. So I think it's a, it's a really a wonderful thing you're doing, and God bless you for it. Well, thank you. I, I think... Dennis, the public library, and, and really the Library of Congress, who's funded this whole yeah. program. And because uh, without them, we wouldn't get to hear the great stories that you veterans yeah. have got to tell. Well, that's great. Well, if there's nothing else, I think we'll sign off. And I appreciate you. Thank service. you very much. Thanks so much, Bill. Been my pleasure. My, Believe it me. Really was mine. I Thank really you.